Hello everyone, today is Thursday, January 16, 2014, and this is the week in charts. I know I say this every week, but I think you got to believe me. This week we have a lot to cover, so I'm going to go get a little jacked up. Ooh, that's a messy one. Yuck. <laughs> on, some, on some Mountain Dew. Makers of Mountain Dew did not compensate me for this uh, free endorsement of their delicious product. But if you're out there at PepsiCo, let me shout out. stuff. Red Bull saw it was too fat. So forget about them. Alright, enough of that nonsense. I guess we have to look at the disclaimer screen. As you know, all predictions are about the future. And a lot of stuff can happen between now and then. Hey, do me a favor. You read my book, you like the book? And if you didn't, I don't know why you're here. <laughs> Throw me a bone. Sometimes more people register and show up for these things that I have um uh, reviews on Amazon. So if you don't mind, put me up a review on Amazon. would be most appreciated, even if you disagree with everybody else, because uh, a couple of reviews up there have nothing to do with the absolute, with the book itself. Absolutely nothing to do with the book. It's pretty amazing. Uh, what do we talk about? Well, I think the dead money um, theme continues uh, here from last week, and we've got a new example or two. So I think I'm going to continue to talk about that. And then we have a discretionary uh, type of trade in order to squeeze out a little more profits and that's going to make a lot more sense in just a minute. So we'll get to that. Uh, I want to talk a little bit again about uh, good stock selection and um, anything you want to talk about start thinking about it now uh, with the exception of individual stock issues. Hold off on those until we get to the charts and then once we uh, get to those charts if you don't mind just ask about them one at a time. I've been thinking about this definition. I kind of woke up this morning really thinking about it. And this was a definition that I found on Infestopedia.com for dead money. A slain term for money invested in security with minor hopes of appreciation or earning a return. Well, one thing I was thinking about this morning is this definition is kind of definite. And if you did know that something was truly dead money, then by all means you should exit the position. But the reason I put the quotes around the dead money is because it's so-called dead money. And if you're following your plan, then you should follow your plan. I'll stop me if you heard that before. But if you're following your plan, then you should follow your plan and let things shake out and let the market tell you when you were truly wrong. So you don't know that it's dead money at the time. And as long as the trade is still open... and doesn't hit the stop, I view it as a viable trade, something that may still work. Now, let's take a look at the current example. Um, they won't always work like this. In fact, we got stopped out of one that was dead money. And I'll talk a little bit about that in a little while. But uh, Tan, we had an entry right around here. And it looked okay for a day or two, and then it came back in. So we had this really nice longer-term trend, and then this market decides to start correcting by going sideways. So what do we do? Well, we're losing money on the trade. Do we just pack it up and leave? No. We've got a stop in place at 32, so we leave the stop in place. Now, granted, sometimes it might come down here, hit that stop, and then decide to take off. And this is where you got to make sometimes a discretionary decision whether or not to stay with the trade. If it keeps going through the stop, like the SLCA did a couple of days ago, then you have to bail out. Okay? But in this particular case, we were fortunate enough that the stock bottomed out before getting to the stop and then began to rally. So knock on wood, so far so good for this particular stock. Now here's another good dead money example. This stock triggers... Somewhere in here, I believe, immediately it looked pretty good, or initially it looked pretty good. But then it rallies back up, and now you have a loss on the trade. But it didn't get to the stop, which was up here somewhere, and then it rolled over. And then, as you know, a couple days ago, it absolutely imploded. Now, we're going to talk about a little discretion on, on what happens when you're uh, able to capture that nice windfall profit overnight. The point is, just stick with the position until proven good, bad, or indifferent. Now, let me hop into discretion for a few minutes, 
and show you how to squeeze a little bit more out of a trade sometimes. And then I want to hop back in to or jump back to the uh, staying with positions, even though you might feel that it's dead money. So before we get back to that, let's first talk about how to squeeze out some additional profits. Well, in this particular case, our initial profit target was right around here. I think 4050 is where it was. So we're short this stock. We want it to go down. And when it gets to 4050, we're going to take half of the position off. Well, we come in and overnight we got a, we have a nice gap lower. And you can see that this stock is now trading well below our initial profit target. So we've we've done much better than the initial profit target. Now, you can always exit on the open when you have a move that's in your favor that exceeds the initial profit target. Exit half of those shares on the open. There's nothing wrong with doing that. If you are newer to trading, then by all means, trade in a little bit more mechanical fashion where you're like, okay, I've got that initial profit target. In fact, I've got even a little bit more than initial profit target on the open. So I'm going to go ahead and lock in those half profits to get used to locking in profits. To put a little money in account. There's nothing wrong with that, okay? Now, once you gain a little bit of experience, sometimes what you could do is you could let that opening range establish itself. And in this particular case, it only rallied up a little bit. Even the high is still well below that initial profit target. So you're still going to get at least your initial profit target before the stock reversed. Now, they won't always do like this. Sometimes you'll get an opening gap reversal where they gap down and they start to rally up. And that's where you're going to have to make some decisions. Let's take a look at this intraday and talk about how to squeeze out some additional profits. Now, this isn't the mother of all examples but it's still a pretty darn good example. In fact, let me make a note when we get to the charts. Before we talk about the charts, I want to bring up uh, one for you and show you what uh, could really be done. Okay. But let's focus on this one for the time being. These are five-minute bars. And if we come down to right here, here's the open. Now, you got to be careful because this looks like a huge move, okay? That looks like that's less than one point move, but that looks like a huge move if you watch it every little tick, especially if you don't have if you have your scaling set to where yesterday it's trading, the day before trading, I should say, is no longer on there. Then all of a sudden that bar looks like this. It's like, wow, that's huge. But the reality is that's just less than one point. Now, sometimes, like I said, intraday can really kind of uh, mess with your mind if you are watching that tick intraday on the open. So sometimes, and this is what I used to do and recommend doing too, and I'll flip back and forth, but you might just want to stay on that daily chart because this little blip here doesn't look like too much on the daily, but on an intraday chart, that can look quite sizable. So you want to try to squeeze out as much profits as you can. You always want to make as much money as possible. And the reason is there will be losses. In fact, if anything, I probably spend too much time talking about losses. I know I show you a lot of big winners, but if you listen to my presentations, I'm always or almost always talking about stops and losses and protecting your capital because it's vitally important to do. But you have to make as much money as possible when the opportunity presents itself. You have to make hay while the sun shines. You need to squeeze out additional profits when the market allows you to. Okay. Now, so you come in, you're feeling pretty good. And again, the market is trading well below your initial profit target. Well, when you have a big winner, it's kind of like you got that tiger by the tail. Not that anything bad won't happen to you. But you've got a big winner coming in. So you're, you're coming from a position of strength. So what you're trying to do is squeeze out some additional profit. So first thing you need to do is have... You want to allow that opening range to be established, but keep in mind, sometimes you'll have a gap open, and it'll just start climbing and climbing and climbing and climbing and climbing. So you have to have an uncle point in mind. Now, an uncle point, um, 
uh, my foreign and, and not so foreign sometimes uh, listeners often ask me, what's an uncle point? And, and I've all, I've heard the term. I had an uncle used to pick on me as a kid. You know, it's like he'd pinch you and say, say uncle, you know, and then that's where I learned the word uncle point um, from. But an uncle point means a point where you're going to give it. You don't want to take any more pain from that reversal. So at the worst, when you have a windfall like this, at the worst that it would be that initial profit target, okay? That way at least you got your initial profit target out of the trade, and then you can let it unfold and see what happens, and that could be your stop, okay? So have a point in mind where you're going to get out just in case the trade doesn't work. Again, there I go again telling you to protect yourself in case the trade doesn't work. Now, once you have that uncle point in mind, hopefully that will allow you for that opening rage to be established. The next question is, Dave, how long do I wait for that opening rage? Well, sometimes an opening rage can happen in a few minutes, and sometimes it can happen over quite a few minutes, maybe over 30 minutes, 40 minutes or so. Sometimes the market will open little gap lower, just kind of die out a little bit, and then rally up, and then you've got your opening range established. So you know what that is, a la Toby Crable, okay? So in this particular case, market gaps down. It finds its high within the first few minutes of trading and then begins to sell off. Now, once it finds its high, you got to determine how you're going to take those partial profits. Now, keep in mind, we have half of the position on. And we're going to keep half of that position on just in case this turns into something much larger. But what we're trying to do here is we're trying to milk out a little bit of extra profits, try to squeeze out a little bit of extra profits on that half a low. So there's three things you could do. You could trail, you could say that's enough, or take the Ron Papillo Showtime 2000 rotisserie method and set it and forget it. When I am doing discretion in the discretionary portfolio, this is usually what I do because it's the easiest way to show discretion for someone who is studying the portfolio because I do have the discretionary portfolio out there. I've got it out on YouTube. And there are some discretionary things that I've done with that. And if something gaps past the stop, I'm sorry, past the initial profit target, okay, if something gaps past that, then I'm going to put in a stop, S-T-O-P, and I'm going to ride it out towards the end of the day, okay? So this is my favorite thing to do, but there's two other things that you could do, too. You could trail it intraday. So let's say it gaps down, your stop's up here, you allow that range to be open. Well, you start trailing that stop down, and then maybe you get stopped out at some level intraday, and things work out pretty good. That's one thing you could do. The other thing you could do is you could say, okay, I'm looking for 40 and a half on the trade. The trade opens up down here at 38. I'm able to ride out that opening range. And now I've got 37 or 36 or whatever the case may be. So I've squeezed out an extra three points on that trade. You know what? That's enough. So you can exit if the market begins to slide like this one did. And this is especially true if it really, really does begin to just implode. At some point, you could say, all right, that's enough. I'll take my half profits down here somewhere. Nothing wrong with that. And again, the other thing you could do is maybe trail it intraday. So where you might look like this, and then they have you get knocked out. Um, again, my favorite thing to do, just in case you catch a trend day lower, is set it and forget it. So after that open rage is established, maybe put it a stop right above that open rage, or even give it a little bit of room, okay, even a little bit more room in here. And then at the end of the day, on the close, exit the position. And again, when I'm using discretion on the portfolio, especially for something that I'm reporting, that's how I do it. In fact, let me show you real quick. This is an example I wanted to pull up a minute ago. And I know a lot of you people are sick of looking at this one. But it just provides so many good examples that I'm going to have to pull it up yet again. So give me a second to get it done pulled up. And this is a discretionary um, trade where letting it ride, you would have done much, much better. And this is how 
uh, in the in the discretionary portfolio that I published. And I think the initial profit target on this one was right around here. I don't know if you can see this line or not. But what I say is, okay, I'll give it at least to that profit target, okay, let it dip, and then I want to exit or to close. Now, in this particular case, it went from an open where you would have gotten out, if you followed it mechanically, of 724 to a close of 9.07. So you made 183, and if you do that over the open, 7.23, you made 25% extra on that trade. That's a pretty amazing move. So every now and then you get one of these trend days, and instead of just exiting on the open, let it ride intraday. And by the end of the day, you squeeze down an extra 25%. Now the question I often get, well, Dave, if it's looking that good, why not keep it? No, no, no. We don't want to get we don't want to get that greedy. We want to try to squeeze out as much as we can on that half loaf. But we don't know if this is going to be the end of the move or the not or not. We don't know if it's going to be the big start of a big new trend. So what we're going to do is we're going to exit half of those shares. But all we're trying to do is just squeeze a little bit more profit out of it. We've got the position. We got the tiger by the tail. We got the position working great. Let's squeeze out a little bit more profits okay so let's do the math on that let me show you a spreadsheet and this is the um, this is a version of this service spreadsheet and the open was 3840 on this particular stock so you were able to squeeze out just by following mechanically an extra 311 bucks as opposed to a normal trade where you'd exit right at the profit target where you get a thousand bucks notice this OCIP Rallied up, we got the initial profit target out of a thousand bucks. Notice this A E R I, we got the initial profit target out of a thousand bucks. It's always going to be a thousand bucks because we're risking two percent on trade. That's two thousand dollars on a one hundred k account. All right. So following it mechanically, following the rules mechanically, you would have gotten out on the open at that thirty eight forty, and you'd have made an extra three hundred bucks. Now. What's cool is if you'd have stuck with the position into the close and we punch in that 36.31, okay, you would have made an extra $600. And if you subtract the $1,300 from that, you made $300 extra on that trade. Now, that doesn't seem like a lot, but annualized, that's a lot of money. Uh, on a percentage basis, it's about a third of a percent on your portfolio, better than the poke of the eye. Uh, also, I mean, I don't want to get silly, but if you did $300 a day, that's $75,000 a year, assuming there are roughly 250 trading days a year. Okay, and I don't want to get into day trading and all those other uh, things that could open up a can of worms, but the point I'm trying to make is squeeze it out a few hundred bucks can be a big deal. And in a case like the one we mentioned earlier, that would have turned out to be several thousand dollars. I think two thousand dollars, if memory serves on that, maybe a little bit more. So that's that's a substantial move, and you've got to make as much profit as possible because there will be losses. Okay, and that's the only thing I can guarantee is it will be losses, right? Now, one thing I'm going to talk about with the dead money, uh, getting back to the dead money, getting away from discretion for a second. I left these slides up from last week. I'm not going to harp on them too much. I just want to kind of touch upon a few things to realize that, that only the short term can be predicted with any degree of accuracy, but the real money is in longer term trading. So we go in and we're trying to get that short term gain, but the market doesn't always work on our time frame. And that's where a protective stop it comes in. And that's where the patient comes in, patience comes in. Because we're still trying, we obviously we want that instant instant gratification, but we also want to be in a position for a long, long time and make a lot of money in a longer term trade because that's where the real money is. Um, you have to be careful about the microwave society and what we live in because the markets don't always move in our time frame. And be, be leery of anyone that talks about some sort of income producing system when it comes to the market. Uh, I do know some that work except they work until they don't. They will blow up. So uh, the, all that income you made over the year you give it all back plus um, you, your account blows up. So be very, very careful about that. Either they are lying to you or there is a blow-up characteristic 
to them. Okay, and either way, you want to run, not walk away. Um, a lot of people say you can't. You could just get back in. No, you can't. Um, no, you can't, Donnie. <laughs> you can't always get back in because sometimes you have a move that looks like this. Okay. All right. It's like, well, we got this dead money in here. And it's going sideways. It's not doing it. I better get out, right? Well, then what happens? It drops four points overnight. Well, hmm, maybe it's a little too oversold to get back in. I better not get back in. Then what happens? drops nine or ten points overnight, okay? So very hard to get back in. The example I used last week was a buyout. So say you – technical analysis suggests that something in the, something in the charts that suggests – the stock is going to move for whatever reason, okay? So GME came out with really bad earnings. I know I took a peek. I'm not supposed to, but I took a peek. Couldn't help it. Whenever a stock makes a big move, sometimes I take a peek, especially if there's a little end by it because my quote feed tells me there's news on it. Um, so they had really crappy earnings. Well, the technical analysis of the chart a few months back, even though it was Christmas time, and everybody and their brother should be buying games, right? Uh, the charts suggested otherwise. Now, technical analysis doesn't always work. If it did, as I often say, it'd be the last day you'd ever see my fat ass again. Uh, but then again, if it always worked, that it would work for everyone, then it would no longer work because there would no longer be a market. So this is kind of wrapping your mind around all those riddles. But it doesn't always work, but it does. It's great what it does, and it suggests things are going to happen, okay, in the market. It suggests things that are going to happen that aren't priced in. But you can't just get in and out willy-nilly thinking that, oh, it's dead money. I'm not going to make any money in a position. Let me just exit. Keep in mind that on every trade, barring overnight gaps, the worst you could lose is 2%. And the most you can make is potentially unlimited, okay? So if you can make an unlimited gain, then let's not obsess too much over this trade where we might lose 2%, okay? Because who knows? That might turn into a big winner where we make many times that amount. And that's where the real money is. So obsess before you get into a trade and not afterwards. Uh, that's one of the one of the most brilliant things I think that's ever kind of slipped out of my mouth. Um, obsessed before you enter a trade and not afterwards. But everybody tends to do just the opposite for some strange reason. Not you guys and girls here, but most people for some reason obsess afterwards. Um, once I'm in a trade, now it's taken me a bit of years to get here, but once I'm in a trade, I find it kind of boring. I, I, I find myself a lot more excited going into a trade then once I'm in the trade, I kind of find it boring. Once I'm in a trade, I'm already looking for my next opportunity because I kind of take an in for a penny, in for a pound approach. And that, that phrase seemed to help out a few people that were struggling with holding on to winners and holding on to so-called dead money stocks too. Uh, people just can't hang on. And, and I don't want to digress too far, but believe it or not, one of the biggest problems I see is people – can't hold on to winners. Uh, it, that's kind of shocking to, for me because if I've got a winner in a portfolio, uh, I, I hope to never take it out of the portfolio. I just love it. It's like I'm almost bummed out when it finally stops out. It's like, wow, I've, I've had such a great relationship with you. Uh, I've, I've enjoyed coming in, watching you go higher every day. But a lot of people, stock will go up 50%. Oh, 50%. That's a lot of money. I'm going to take that. I'm going to take that money. Well, Guess what? The stock will quite often go up to 100%. If it's went up 50%, then it might be able to go up 100%. If it goes up 100%, then it might be able to go up 200%. Rinse and repeat. I'm not saying it's going to be a straight line. If you look at the chart that I used last week on our big winner, one of our big winners for last year, which I think recently stopped out, uh, it stopped out at about 150%, but it was up 25%, then it was up 50%, then it was up 100%, then it was up 200%, and then obviously we gave back some of those profits. But trying to guess that top at 25% or 50%, you're going to miss that 100 or 150% move. So that's a big problem that a lot of people have. 
Uh, so you want to try to be as hands-off as possible. Let the market make the decisions for you. If you've got to stop in at 30 bucks on or 32 bucks, wherever it was, on something like tan, just let it go. Now it's at 42. Okay, it's 25 percent higher. I can't guarantee you that'll always happen. Okay, one thing I can guarantee is you will get stopped out of some trades. So what? Who cares? All right, you get stopped out of trade, you get stopped out of trade. Move on. Next. And then once again, not to beat the dead horse, catching the occasional outlier is key. And what don't you? What don't you? Big winners can make your entire year. So. Forget about the dead money. The market is the final arbiter. I like that. That might be my new quote. The market is the final arbiter. Here's the deal. This is going to make your life a lot easier. The pressure's off. Let the market make decisions for you, okay? I come in today, oh, I got RLYP. What do I do? Do I get in? You know, do I get out? I got OCIP. Do I get in? Get out? I got LILX. What do I do? What do I do? A-E-R-I, T-A-N-G-M-E, M-E-O-H. NG, oh, I don't know what to do. What do I do? No, I don't do anything. I follow my plan, okay? Yeah, I got them up on the quote screen. I'm watching them as I'm talking right now, okay? I'm kind of excited because everything's kind of working in my favor. I mean, just because I decided to become a trader doesn't mean that I no longer have a pulse. But I'm not going to micromanage RLYP. It's up a buck twenty. Well, I'm happy it's up a buck twenty. Might not be up a buck twenty by the end of the day, but so what? So far, it's moving in my favor. We'll keep it on, okay? MEOH not working out so well, but huh? I might come in tomorrow. It might be down twenty bucks, okay? I'm gonna let it unfold and see what happens. So obsess before you get into a trade, and not afterwards. And by the way, I don't know if you know when to bring. Let me just show you this again. The other thing that happened, we had two trades in here that just came out. One was a winner overall, and one was a loser, NCR and SLCA. SLCA, we got nicked for $2,000, okay? Uh, NCR, I think, was a $1,000 gain in the scratch. So net-net, we had two trades come out, and it cost us $1,000 for those two trades, okay? But now we've got trades that are left that this one right here is already up a couple thousand bucks, okay? Better than poking the eye, okay? RLYP, this one might turn into a big winner here, um, up a buck twenty today. So we're going to let things unfold. The other thing that happened, and this is the portfolio ebb and flow of doing these very simple things by say, okay, I got to stop. If I get stopped, and it keeps on going, okay, if it just kind of nicks the stop, it turns around, goes straight back up, I'm okay. But if it nicks the stop, I'm sorry, if it goes through the stop, then I've got to exit. So by doing that, we got taken out of two trades. And by waiting for an entry, what happened? Well, we got put in another trade. We got put in this gold stock. Now, this gold stock actually went up while the market was sliding. It didn't mitigate the damage overall in the portfolio on that particular day. But... At least we made a little bit of money on that day. At least it, it helped to kind of cushion that slide a little bit. Now, I don't say let's go out and buy gold every time the market looks a little questionable, but it was set up, so we got an entry, so we took the trade. So what happened over the last few days? We got knocked out of two because we're honoring our stops. One at a profit overall, one at a loss. Okay, net, net, minus $1,000. So what? 1% of the portfolio. We can live, we can live with that, okay? And then we got triggered into a new position. That new position might double or triple, okay? And if it does, then we're going to make a lot of money. Let's say it doubles, okay? Then we're going to make a lot of money. <laughs> Let's see. If it doubles, we're going to make... Oh, a lot of money, uh, a boatload, okay? Now, uh, just on the charts, so ebb and flow, a couple of uh, a couple of things are coming out of all this. One, stick with them until proven right right or wrong. Trail a stop if you're right. Honor your stop if you're wrong. Let the ebb and flow take you out of stocks and put you in new ones. And don't stress over. I mean, I've been looking at that SLCA for a while going, is this dog ever going to do anything? And it never did. And I was also thinking the same thing about TAN. And a couple of days I'm like, ah, should we just scrap this thing? It's like, no, 
I'm going to follow my plan. And the reason I follow my plan is because my plan is out there, okay, at least on those particular stocks. So my plan is out there. Then on my personal stocks, I, or I should say stocks outside of the service, if I'm long something, I need to look at them really hard if I am not following my plan, okay? So I'm forced to follow my plan because you can see most of my plan through here. And then every now and then I'll take a stock outside of um, outside of the service. But usually, 99% of the all times, those stocks are going to be on the Landry list. And I'll talk about that in just one second. Um, I left this graphic in. This was uh, put in here a few weeks back by someone who was trying to get a fill within five cents and didn't get filled. And I think, I forget which stock that was. I think it was AERI. And that stock is now up about 50% from that entry. So it makes a very painful but wonderful example. And sometimes learning can hurt a little bit. But it makes a wonderful example. Like don't trip over the nickels while going for the dollars. That's an old hedge fund adage. And obsess before you get to a trade, not afterwards. Trade your plan, you trade, trade your plan. Greg says, they were still holding Excel. Remember, and I was uh, impressed how long you held it. Yeah, that one was, that one was held for uh, two and a half years. Now, that didn't turn out to be a super volatile stock, so it's not like this little uh, solar stock or something that went up 600% over six or seven months. But it did go up uh, a couple hundred percent, I think, over a couple of years' time, so it's better than a poke in the eye. And just let things unfold. And our goal is to end up with a portfolio of these positions that run longer term. So just let them go. Yes, don't you mean 2% of the account and not 2% of trade dollars? Yeah, yeah. If you have a $100,000 trading account, and I often use that just because it makes good round numbers and makes it easy to do the math, then you're risking $2,000 per trade if stopped out. You're not buying $2,000 worth of a stock. You're buying $2,000 or shorting $2,000 if stopped out. And the math in this spreadsheet is done for you. If you want this exact spreadsheet right here, I'll give it to you. The math's already in here. So if you had, if you put the risk in uh, here, let's say we've got a half a point risk. Let's say you're only risking one point, risking a whole point on this thing. Then you're, you would buy, um, you'd buy 2,000 shares and then you'd put a bit, you'd divide them by two. Okay. So we're risking 0 0.5 in this particular case on this particular stock. So you buy 4,000 shares. Now that's a lot, but it's, eh, you know, you're only risking a half a point. So if stopped out, you're still going to lose what? $2,000, okay? How much can you win? You can win a lot. Hey, Dave, what if market gaps down and skips your stop loss? Do you simply exit as soon as possible? Uh, uh, no, D, uh, what you do in that particular case, and I hope I have a... Blank screen in here still. If not, I have to. Um, I have to get one. I have to fix that. Um, his question is because something bad could always happen to you. Let's say you do have your stop in right here. What if the market gaps down here? Okay, and your loss is bigger than you intended. You only intended to move this much, lose this much, and now you have a loss of that much. Well, read the second half of the layman's guide to trading stocks on sale now. And that's where I talk about this opening gap reversal discretion. And if you look in um, all of the webinars, you'll find a lot of the webinars I've done in the past. Get the flash drive, and I've talked about that too, these damage control situations when they occur. Um, if the stock does gap lower, way lower like this, let's say it stops up here, gaps down here, you wait to see if that opening range is established and see if it comes back up. And sometimes you're going to be shocked, and sometimes it'll come all the way back up and keep on keeping on, and you'll actually keep the trade, okay? But many cases, not all cases, but many cases, you're able to somewhat mitigate those losses. And just like we rode that trend down in those two little stocks, or trend up, I should say, in the, in the SBWR, or trend down in the GME, you do the same thing. You use the same sort of mentality. But in this case, you're hoping to play that reversal, and you're hoping that it will reverse, and you can mitigate your losses and that can often save you uh, quite a bit okay now if you're not disciplined then close your eyes and just get out okay 
and then hopefully someday you'll get disciplined to where you can mitigate those losses. I've seen stocks come back, come back, believe it or not, 10 points or more intraday. Okay, so that's that's where you don't want to completely lose your head while everybody else is losing theirs. You gotta, it hurts. Don't look at the math too much because that might mess you up. Because you could be looking at the math, going, "Oh my God, I could buy a car with the money I just lost in the stock, or whatever the case may be." Don't look at the math. Don't look at the money. Look at the stock and say, "Okay, does this stock look like it's going to reverse it here? Has it found its low?" Um, I'm going to give it a little bit of uncle point, a little uncle rum here. I'm going to give it maybe another point or so. I already have a 10 point loss on the books. What's another point going to hurt? I mean, what's another couple hundred bucks? I'm already down a ridiculous amount on this one. What's another few hundred bucks? So what? And if it does reverse, then sometimes you can get back all of your losses. And then some. Not always, but sometimes you can at least mitigate those losses. And that incremental risk on that one or two trades is going to make up all the difference in the world. And what if it continues to slide down the next day? No, you're going to be out of all of the position, okay? So if you're stopped out, you're stopped out, all right? I'm only I'm just telling you how to mitigate your damage, okay? So let's go back to this uh, slide here. I said I wasn't going to spend a lot of time talking about it, and we ended up doing That's okay. If I could find it. Where'd it go? Okay, here we go. Okay. Here's your stop. Okay. This is where the market opens. Okay. Let's say you determine this is your uncle point. You're going to get out no matter what. If it comes down here and hits this, you get out. You get out of the entire position. You bail out. Forget about it. Okay. You're not going to say, well, maybe it'll stop today. Maybe it'll stop tomorrow. Maybe it'll stop the next day. No. The damage is done. You've got to get out. You're just trying to mitigate the damage. You're just trying to survive the loss. You already have this big loss of the books. Now you just have to deal with it that day, intraday, okay? And if it doesn't hit your uncle point, it begins to reverse, then you can trade out of the position. That's trading 2.01. 2.01. That's a little bit, uh, 202, a little bit more involved. Okay, you got it. Okay, fantastic. Okay, uh, BBY gap down hugely and is recovering some. Low was at the open. Let's take a look at that real quick, and then we'll hop back and finish up the um, charts. Yeah, uh, BBB, da, da, da. BBY, that's Best Buy, got hit the same day that, um, uh, was that today? Oh, my goodness. There was another one uh, that got hit. Maybe it was BBBY. Let me just see, BBBY. Yeah, wow. <laughs> I thought it was, I, I didn't realize, I thought it was uh, Best Buy, but it was Bed Bath & Beyond. Okay, here's a case where you could see it, this is a case where it gapped lower and kept on going. Let's say you were long this stock for whatever reason, okay. Well, it's like, okay, well, Dave says, let me hang on. It's like, well, wait a minute, it's dropping, it's dropping, it's dropping, maybe I better bail out. So in this particular case, it did not reverse, and then, you can't live in hope because look what happens a week later. Look how much more damage. Now, in this particular case, let's say you were along this BBY, okay? Well, it reversed on the open, so you would stick with it and try to mitigate your losses. Now, it looks like it's not going straight up. So in this particular case, you wouldn't try to ride it out all day long. You're in a different position when you're trying to mitigate the losses. You're just looking to try to get out relatively unscathed. So unless this thing starts to go straight up if you were long this stock, which I don't think you should be because look at the big gap down here in all of your sell patterns, and certainly you would be stopped out probably by now on that. But, hey, it happens, right? But you can see, like, it really hasn't made a huge rally in here just yet. So maybe you'd maybe be time to cut and run uh, if you were still uh, long that stock. And then you get, eh, you maybe get a buck or so improvement, better than the poke in the eye as far as uh, damage control goes. Okay, got one or two more things to cover, and then I'm going to take a look at the overall market, and then we'll hop out into the um, and take a look at your stock picks, okay? Um, this is the, these are the stocks from my stock selection webinar I did a while back. As I said, I kind of been beating a dead horse on these. 
But the thing is, you put some work out there and you get a little nervous because you don't know how it's going to turn out. And so far, it's turned out pretty good. Now, if I was, uh, if you're personally managing this list, these ones down here, these three at the bottom, you probably would uh, take them out of your list and let the winners continue to ride. But the reason I'm showing you this yet again is it just shows you what a good uh, offense can look like. If you go back to the date of the webinar, it was on the 14th, okay? And these were the stocks that I found, or I should say we found because we all looked through these stocks together for the following day. This AERI, you'll notice, is in the portfolio now. Uh, some of you guys did take the Gale and the Invax, so congratulations on that. Gale just kept on pulling back, and it never did trigger, but then when it, it finally did trigger, it took off nicely. So you can see by picking the best stocks, these type of gains are possible. Now, I know it's kind of stupid to look at on an annualized basis, but you can see that these gains are just tremendous on an annualized basis. This whole time, the market's up about 3%. So uh, don't quote me on that. It's probably somewhere between 2 and 4%, but you get the idea. You could see by picking the best stocks, you have the potential to capture some pretty uh, huge gains. So, so far, so good on that. Okay, a um, couple of random thoughts, and then I want to hop out to the overall markets. I went a little longer than I planned today, but that's okay. It's always, uh, once I get started, it's kind of hard for me to stop. Uh, take things one day at a time. We had that one nasty down day, and I always kind of, um, I always find myself kind of watching what happens in the chat um, when when these when the market begins to slide or whatever. And it's I just kind of it cracks me up. It's like uh, everyone talks like it's the absolute end of the world. And just a couple of days prior, we were not too far from all time highs in the P's, multi year highs in Nasdaq, uh, all time highs in the Russell. And then uh, we have one little down day, and everybody thinks it's the end of the world. We're going to pick that down day apart in just a second. So focus on the longer-term trend. Um, I tend to do better when the market doesn't go straight in one direction. And maybe it's because I'm in those more inefficient stocks that can sometimes, sometimes we the keyword in this sentence, trade contra to the overall market. Um, you want to err on the side of the trend. You notice we did have some shorts in the portfolio. Um, one of them's not working. One of them's working pretty well. And then the other one stopped out for a little bit better than a scratch trade for a thousand bucks, 1%, however you want to look at it. Uh, those were simply because that's what the database was producing at the time. I didn't go crazy and load the boat. There were two or three other ones at the time I didn't take. They just so happened that some of them worked out nicely. At least they were on my radar. That's what my wife says. But for the most part, you want to err on the side of the trend. So don't freak out if the market corrects a little bit. There will be corrections. And let the ebb and flow take you out. Again, like I said a few minutes ago, we got knocked out of two stocks. Ironically, one was a short. Okay. And then we got triggered into a new stock. We got triggered into a gold stock. So... Don't try to outsmart the market. Pick the best stocks that you can and make sure you have a plan. Wow, I'm going to write that down. Pick the best stocks that you can and make sure you have a plan. If you get triggered, take the stock. If you don't get triggered, don't take it. If you're already in a stock, then honor your stop, S-T-O-P. Okay? So don't try to outsmart the market. Let the ebb and flow take you in and out of positions. Uh, ask yourself, is the market near new highs? And if it, the answer is yes, then give it the benefit of the doubt. If you're within a percent or two of all-time highs or multi-year highs in an index, then give it the benefit of the doubt. Okay? Remember that a uh, market making new highs, by definition, isn't a trend. And then one thing you can do is you want to wait for some sort of signal before getting too bearish about the overall market. It's okay to take an individual short or two like we did as they present themselves, but don't go out and go crazy, bail out of all your longs, and load the boat on the short side just because the market has one or two down days, especially when it's hovering around those old highs. Do wait for a signal. Wait for a first thrust, a bow tie, or at least things to settle down on a net-net basis, okay? If we come in here, where are the P's today? Looking kind of soft, 1844. Let's say we're doing this uh, webinar in March, a couple of months from now. In the markets around 1844, then we need to say, well, hmm, 
net net market has it going anywhere in a couple of months. Maybe it has lost momentum. Maybe it is going sideways. Maybe I should sit up my hands and not do a whole lot. And in that particular case, if you can't stand it, okay, take a setup whether it be on the long side or the short side. So wait for some sort of signal before getting bearish, or at the least, at least wait until the market doesn't make much progress on a net-net basis. Um, and I can't harp on this enough. Play a good offense in 2014. Be selective. If you can't stand it, again, take the trade. All right, let's, um, let me look at the overall market real quick, and then we'll, uh, we'll open it up for quick. In fact, if you want to start asking about individual issues, feel free to start doing that now. Uh, a couple announcements in here. Uh, again, um, I'm just so proud of the way the stock webinar turned out. So I want to thank everybody for um, showing up. A couple of you uh, ladies and gentlemen here today. So thanks for that. Thanks for that. Reminder: tomorrow we have one another follow-up session. There's a few more of these sessions left. So I uh, hope to see you there if you can make it. If not, I am recording. I'm speaking of recordings. What I'm going to do between now on January 31st, and after that, I haven't decided what I do, what I'm going to do. But between now and January 31st, anybody who signs up for one year, of my service will get the recordings for free. Uh, I do have 2013 weekend charts available. A lot of the questions I get asked in these um, webinars are going to obviously be in there. It's 30 something hours. Uh, it's very, um, they're pretty good if I say so myself. How's that? Uh, my books are, my first two books are still relevant, and I'll often talk about strategies and patterns out of those books in these webinars, so check those out. Um, there's some other books I'd recommend, so see this link here on my website. And what else is going on? I think that's, I think that's good. Uh, I do have a trading service, as you know, so check that out. Again, if you go with a whole year of that, then um, I'll hook you up with the stock selection webinars. Okay. All right, good. Keep those coming. Keep the individual stocks coming, one long, one at a time. Thank you. Uh, let me look at the overall market, then we'll look at those. Uh, we'll look at your stock picks. Okay. Okay. All right, I'm going to look at the micro, and then I'm going to work my way out to the macro. And just give me one second to get this set up in here. Let's go to this um, file here. Get Nicholas ready, just in case Don shows up. <laughs> Guess I need to get my electric cordium gram going too, huh? There it is. All right, I got those ready for Don. Okay, let's take a look at the peas first. And I like to look at the micro, I didn't work my way out to the macro. Now, today's action is a little disappointing. But again, let's not focus too much on the day-to-day -day action. First of all, we had the big slide where everybody said the sky is falling. And even prior to that, I did a column about the sky is falling because people come up with all these statistics. And statistics are worthless. I think 74% of all people know that. And they're claiming, oh, this American Association of Investors is bullish or something. So that means the market's going to sell off and blah, blah, blah. And you got the big sell-off day, and everybody's like, ah, I told you so. There was a wave count of a 22, 31, 22, whatever it is, suggesting a top. And then what happens? The market turns right around and goes right back up. We don't worry about all that. We just look at the charts, and we could see that the market was in a bit of a range. It broke down out of that range. That's not the end of the world. In fact, if all you did was wait for markets to break down out of a range and then buy them when they take out the top of their range, I think it would test out. I've done some uh, volatility type of work in the past where you look for a compression volatility, you look for a break out, or I guess in this case a breakdown, and then you buy the top of the range or you buy that other expansion out of that compressed volatility. And I would imagine right around here you probably had a compressed volatility, but notice it took out the bottom of the range. I'm no longer that short-term oriented, but 
it's like I've learned all this stuff, so I certainly uh, don't want to forget it. But you can see you took out the bottom of the range, and then when it takes out the top of the range, you, it would have been a buy. You got a pretty good little run out of that for the peas, okay? Now we take it out the bottom of this range. I think uh, I think it's still possible that we could see some pretty decent uh, trends here. When in doubt, back to chart way out, okay? And it has a bit of straight line higher, but for the most part, the market's done fairly well over the last couple of years. The other thing you could do, it's really simple, literally simple. Just plot a simple day, a simple day, plot a 50-day simple moving average. And pay careful attention to daylight. Daylight meaning that the lows are greater than the moving average, okay? And as long as the lows are greater than the moving average, you want to stay long, or you certainly want to err on the side of the long side. When the highs are less than the moving average, you need to think about whether or not you should be shorting, okay? And you certainly want to honor your stops on existing longs. And you can see you had a little daylight back here, but the market just kind of faked out and went right back up. You had a little daylight right here, okay? But the market just kind of faked out and went right back up. One thing I've toyed with in the past is you kind of look at these pivots below the moving average, and until that pivot gets taken out, that's another little gem I want to throw out at you, uh, don't get too excited about the overall market. Now, back here in 2012, um, it did look like the market was turning, and I did uh, put some shorts on. And like I told my peeps, it's like, okay, worst thing happens, we don't make any money on these shorts, we get stopped out, and the market goes straight up, and we make a lot of money on the longs, and it looks like that's what happened. That's fine with me, too. But as a general statement, again, you want to look at the daylight in the market. Keep an eye on that 50-day moving average. I don't plot the 50-day moving average every day, but when the market gets a little iffy or begins to sell off, the first thing I do is like, oop, where's that 50-day moving average, okay? And in this particular case, it's around 1,800. Well, what else is around 1,800 when you got support around 1,800? So it is worth watching when it's worth watching, okay? Hope that it made sense. Let's take a look at NASQAQ. Technology has been doing really well as of late. And again, we had a little bit of fake out down to the to the prior little range. Kind of looks like we got a little Darvis action going on in the quack for you uh you box fans out there. Okay. It's been pretty cool. It's been making a box, making another box, making another box. Hopefully it rinse and repeat, but so far so good. I love these little boxes stacking on top of each other, little stair steps higher, okay? See if I could draw that in TC. See what that would look like. That might look pretty cool. That would be a step. That would be a step. That would be a step. Okay. And hopefully that staircase continues to build. Will this be the top of the stairs? I don't know. Am I interviewing myself? I think so. But I know this. I know I want to err on the side of the trend. Just for S&G's, let's put that 50-day moving average in. So it's about 40-50, which is right around this prior consolidation here. The other thing with a moving average, too, notice the slope of the moving average is positive in here. Positive slope plus daylight. If you didn't know anything about the markets, but you knew that the moving average had positive slope and you had daylight, I mean, look at this. Look at this last run in here. If that doesn't get you excited, then you need to find another line of business, okay? Look how exciting that is. Just by watching that daylight in this market, okay, you'd have been long for about the last thousand or so points, okay? You did have a little little test of the moving, moving average back here, and then what happened, the market took right back off, okay? A little shake out, a little fake out. Remember, it's the market's job to try to knock you out. Okay, I know that's kind of crazy when you talk about the market as like a being. But it is a being. It's a collective of, um, of beings, okay? All right, that's the NASDAQ. Um, I'm not going to spend a tremendous amount of time on the sectors. Uh, most of all, most of them are, uh, are winning. Duh. Let's take a look at the Rusty real quick. Rusty here right at all-time highs. Uh, kind of more boxy looking than the rest of the indices, but certainly has worked its way higher. 
for quite a long time. Let's take a look at, oh, we could just take a look at some random sectors in here. Uh, hardware, new highs. Software, new highs. Um, semiconductors have been on a tear as of late, breaking out in here. Drugs, pretty much anything drug-related, especially delivery stocks, have been really headed higher. Biotech, just banging out new highs. In here, health services doing fairly well in here. I mean, this is don't confuse the issue with facts. You may or may not like Obamacare. I may or may not like Obamacare. Does the market care? No, market doesn't care. Market seems to think biotech stocks are going higher. Maybe there's another reason they're going higher. I don't know. We've got a couple of doctors in here. Uh, Sharon, why is biotech going higher? Is there a reason for that? Okay, we're waiting on Sharon. Manufacturing, brand new highs. Leisure, especially resorts and casinos, doing pretty good here. A couple of areas stinking up the joints, like joint, like restaurants, okay? More people want to buy it. Ah, good answer. Good answer. I was, see, I was trying to trick Sharon. And I also wanted to know for myself. I also was to was see if she's going to say that uh, uh, the medical plans, whatever, will allow for certain uh, experimental treatments. And No, she said more people want to buy it. That's right. That's right. Buying pressure, okay? Not necessarily more people want to buy it, but buying pressure. But you could call it more people want to buy it. Buying pressure and selling pressure. Because technically, every time somebody buys it, somebody sold it to them, right? Well, I guess you could have some shorts, and that kind of mucks that up. But you get the idea. Retail, lagging in here. In fact, retail actually imploding a little bit today. Now, I'm not going to go crazy bearish. But when I see something like this, a chart that looks like this, let me just throw a moving average in for S&Gs, okay? When I see a bow tie coming off of all-time highs, then maybe there's a top in place, okay? So we could end up with a market that goes higher, but you could end up with rolling corrections. So I might fire off a short or two here and there, but I'm not going to focus exclusively on the short side. We've got one sector looking pretty cruddy, maybe two if you count restaurants, okay? But restaurants aren't that big of a sector. Retail's a little bit more significant. And most other sectors, transports at or near new highs, okay, doing pretty good. So banks uh, at or near new highs, uh, today notwithstanding. So I might squeeze off a short in something like retail. In fact, I think we already did in the GME. Should a great opportunity present itself. But don't go crazy bearish. Don't sell the form just because the market has a little bit of a stumble here and there. Uh, a couple of areas I want to look at really quick. Gold has been bottoming out, as I say quite often and preach. Uh, it might be more of a process than an event because it sure is taking its own sweet time. Silver also looking pretty good. Uh, speaking of earths, uh, I'm being asked about uranium. I am bullish on uranium, okay? I think uranium looks pretty good. So URA looking pretty good in here. When these uranium stocks go, man, they can go, okay? So I love them, but it's usually a pretty bumpy ride, so just be careful along the way. So the bottom line is the state of the market is good. Sector actions looking pretty good in here, so I think things are uh, doing well. Biotech is going higher because it wants to go higher. Who cares why? Just go long. I agree. See, Don's making sense today. I'm, I'm going to plan on picking on Don, and now he's making sense. Damn you, Don. BLP for Mr. Phil. Phil, you still got some uh, GME work in there, buddy? VLE looks okay. Um, I like a little bit more excitement in my IPOs. I know it had a pretty good run from 28 higher. 28 to 34, um, what is that round numbers? Um, is that 6 divided by 28, 20%? Uh, That's only about a 20% move higher. Um, take a look at like ARI. You know, this is the kind of move I like to see in a buy, a, a, um, I'm sorry, a, a, an IPO. Uh, before we got in this one, it moved up. Let's see how higher. Don took his pill today. Good. 51%. Uh, you see, it had a, like a 50% run before pulling back. So I'd like to see a little bit more excitement. The other thing, too, is now I'm going to stop short of saying 
funny men, funny mentals, okay? But when you do have a um, an IPO, and this is where I've got to tread lightly and be careful, but it is a good idea to go in and see what they do. If it's a biotech company and biotech's on fire like it is now, then just go with it, okay? Forget about it. The ARI up 50%, that's beautiful. Gale, well, I'm sorry, Gale's not an, um, an IPO. Maybe we're thinking about RLYP. Uh, these IPOs that are that are medicine related, biotech related, medicine's doing great, biotech doing great. The by all means, go with them. This is Valero. Valero is what uh, it's Valero Energy Partners. Isn't that like the stop and rob stations? Valeros. Uh, I don't know if it's the same thing or not, but you might want to look it up and see. I think we had this conversation last week, so I would eliminate this one from my personal watch list because I like to see some more excitement at the IPO. But, Phil, I can't fault you because it does not look that bad. You did have a pretty good run from lows, and you did have a pullback that hasn't triggered yet. So I'm going to give you a not bad on that one, but I think that uh, you could probably find or eventually find better in IPOs. Okay, ATHX mentioned two weeks ago for Howard. ATHX mentioned two weeks ago. Yeah, it looks good. Were you in it two weeks ago? Okay. Uh, my only concern now is it shot up about 100% over a very short period of time. I think back then it had uh, overhead resistance, but it didn't seem to care about that. Um, so, yeah, on a pullback, but it could be a little dangerous. You want to see a pretty deep pullback on that one, but it would be very, very dangerous to go after. Okay. Mont, M-O-N-T. Mont. Montage. Um, it looks okay. I mean, it looks like it's becoming a box stock, okay? <laughs> build the box, build the box, and then it's broken out. Uh, maybe a little bit more pullback on that one. But, yeah, maybe on a pullback it might be worthwhile. It's a little unorthodox looking, but I certainly can't argue with it. Brett, that's going to be kind of a, a dangerous stock. Let's take a look at the plug. Okay. And my problem with it now is it's going up like 800%, okay, and that's what I call a bottle rocket. It's just, it's kind of dangerous, and I know longer term, I think it's coming off of pretty low levels, fairly low levels, but at this juncture, it's too darn dangerous. If you're long, stay long and hold on, okay, long ATHX from 2.55, 2.55, gotcha. Yeah, that would have been a breakout play. My, you know, my, it's not, my methodology is not my way or highway. My methodology won't necessarily catch every move in the world, okay? So there will be times where stocks will go higher that, that actually don't trigger um, uh, my signals. It happens. A-N-G-I. Let me get Nicholas ready just in case. No. <laughs> no, it's gone sideways. What do you want to do with that? Nothing. Absolutely nothing. Um, no. No, it's kind of all over the place. It's it, Looks like it's had its run now. It's done. QLTY for Mr. Peter. One of the Peters, I should say. QLTY. Oops. QLTY. Uh oh. There it is. Uh, it's a trucking stock. Uh, my concern is that it's just getting past its prior highs in here. Um, and it is a little wide and loose longer term. I think I would pass on this one. I don't like these. Um, these big V-shaped recovery so when they look like this, and you're just getting kind of past the prior highs in here. Let me back the chart out a little bit. Oh, that is the whole chart. Uh, no, I think I'd pass on that one. And then if you notice, like, your last big bar, you've had these one or two big bars higher, and this can just kind of flatten out in here. I'd flatten out on that one. I'd, I'd uh, pass on that one. F and F for John. F and F. Uh, no, too many days in the pullback, okay? One, two, three, four, five. That's a week. Six, seven, eight, nine, ten. That's two weeks. Eleven, twelve, thirty, forty, fifth. Three weeks. So it's three weeks with lack of any forward progress. I mean, I hear you. It's still in the trend. It's pullback. But after about three weeks, I tend to take them off of my radar. After two weeks, I take them off my radar usually. S fun for Orsini. Snap you in. Okay. Um, 
this one's pretty much going straight up. So if you wanted to trade it, you'd have to have a pretty serious correction. A correction looks maybe something like that or whatever. I think it's a little dangerous to get in on just a tiny correction on that one. Um, and it's also in a fairly mature trend. It's already up about 300% in its last run. So not that it can't keep going higher, but I would wait for either a deep correction or try to maybe catch something a little bit newer trend. URZ for Calvin. URZ. Um, I do like uraniums. URZ, my problem with it is it's got a lot of overhead um, supply to it. Okay. So that's the only trouble with that. Uh, but it's getting through it, though. It sure is getting through it. But it would almost have to get up way up here and then pull back for me to get excited about it. And then I'd be worried about some more overhead supply back here. So kind of a wild and crazy one. It's too bad all this trading back here from this point backwards uh, isn't further back in time on that one. TNDM, Tandem. Okay. Yeah, this is one I've been watching. Um, and it's kind of cool because it's kind of a breakout type of play in an IPO. Um, it's had a decent run in here. It's pulling back. Maybe on a little bit more pullback, it might be worth a shot, but certainly needs to be on your radar. BBBY for a short. We just looked at that one, didn't we? BBBY. Uh, it's too late, okay? Once you have a big crack like this, it's too late for short. I'd even say GME is too late for a short, okay? Um, too late. But if you're short, stay short, okay, by all means. That's going to be the mother of all go go no go examples. Don wants to know about pot. Probably not going to like it. Well, I don't get hungry every time we talk about his stock. <laughs> no. Where's Nicholas? Where's Nicholas when you need him? I lost him. Here he is. No. Why would you buy a stock that's going straight sideways that has a mountain of overhead resistance? Same thing I said last week, Don. Don wants to know about 4.2. If I can get it to come up. Okay. Now, Ford looked a little bearish last week. Now it's pushing into this overhead supply. I would not buy nor sell this stock. I would not buy it on a train. I would not buy it in the rain. I would not sell it in the snow. Wherever that um, Dr. Seuss rhyme goes. Um, but no, it's pushing back this overhead supply. Tagu says SWIR. That one's has been trending. Yeah, it's a little, you know, here's a case where maybe it's a little bit too much of a pullback, okay? But sometimes it could pull back deeply and snap back. I'll give it an okay. Um, but, yeah, it's almost too deep because it's pretty much, it pretty much pulled all the way back. No, I'm going to pass on it now. It pulled back all the way to its prior breakout point. So there's a case where it's too much of a pullback, okay? Pullbacks have to be kind of uh, Goldilocks dries. These shippers have been doing pretty good, uh, except in this particular case, those that broke out and then it came all the way back in. So I would leave that one alone. Shorter term, it almost looks like a short, but it's at relatively low levels. Okay. There's some other shippers out there that look better than that. So maybe look at shipping to find something better. Let's see. See, if you look at the overall sector, the overall sector, well, it's not great, but it's almost at new highs. So there might be something a little bit better. See, look at that one, banging out new highs in here. That one should go on your momentum list, okay? Look at that one, banging out new highs. That should go on your momentum list, okay? As opposed to, look at that one, banging out new highs. That should go on your momentum list. You see, you see, how, you see what I'm saying here? 
So these stocks in here that are banging on new highs, you probably need to be watching for setups as opposed to those that have broke out but then come all the way, have came all the way back in. Uh, DDD, DDD. Um, yeah, DDD looks okay. I mean, it could be a volatile stock. Um, I guess you would already trigger it into it. It looks okay. I mean, here's a case where the more you look at it, the more you can kind of pick it apart. Uh, it looks like the run may be kind of, kind of over here. I mean, it's up 900% from the 2011 lows. Um, it might be a little mature, as some people say, in its trend. The trend might be a little mature. So I, I, I think I'd, pi I'd pass on a base on that. Fonar, F-O-N-R. A lot of stocks today. Good job, guys. Uh, no, it's 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 pulled back to its prior little breakout level in here, so I'd leave that one alone. Twitter for Phil. Okay, um, I would leave Twitter alone now because it made these brand new highs in here, and then it's come back down. It's just kind of been all over the place, and then you know it's a big thick stock and it's over traded, so leave it alone unless it made new highs and started trending well and then pulls back again. PRGN, PRGN, uh, no, no, um, I mean, I hear you, it's trying to bottom out, maybe look at some of those other shipping stocks in here on pullbacks, thoughts on Leaf, Leaf, for Alvin, I think that was Alvin, uh, yeah, it's already begun. To, it's kind of already begun to rally. It's pulled back. It didn't really pull back that much. Ideally, I like to see a little bit deeper pullback, but it had a pretty nice persistent trend yet here. Um, I would pass. It would have to make new highs and pull back again to be set up. You, 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 you. Never heard of it. You, you. Uh, it's thin. That's why. Yeah, it's too thin to trade. And I don't know what this. Stupid little tick way up here is bad tick, I guess. <laughs> I was mad at somebody once, and I was walking down the property, had some ticks on me, and the other trader told me, "Why don't you stick them in?" A... <laughs> God, this is a long story. He's like, "Why don't you stick them in an envelope and send them some bad ticks?" I, I guess you had to be there. It was funny though. If I divulged who, if I divulged all the players of the story, then I would get in trouble. So I can't say it. <laughs> Oh, I entertain myself. L G N D. L G N D. Um, yeah, I mean it's a pharmaceutical. It looks like it's on fire, like the rest of them, uh, but it's not set up yet. So wait for the next setup here. It was kind of wide and loose in the past, but it looks like it's kind of getting its act together. So if it keeps breaking out, maybe on a pullback. Absolutely. Okay. Horizon H Z N P. H Z N P. Uh, yeah, not bad. Maybe a tiny bit deeper pullback there, and it could be worthwhile. Uh, again, it's a pretty. It's another case where it's had a pretty good run, so it may be over for now. On a pullback, check back with me. F e y e. F e y e. Yeah, on a pullback. I mean, it's making new highs, but um, on a pullback, maybe. Uh, yeah, maybe. I mean, it's had a pretty good run, but on a pullback, let's take a look at it. MGA. It's going to be Magma or something. Magna. Um, no, I don't like the way it's just kind of uh, crawling back to its old highs in here. It's kind of a V-shaped recovery at high levels. Not a big fan of that pattern. But it did have a pretty good run going into it, as you can see. A little bit thinner stock. I'm sorry, thinner, lower in volatility stock. Uh, doesn't mean that you can't trade it because it's had a pretty good run in here, but low in volatility. Uh, it's just you know sideways, wide and loose for the last uh, couple of months. So I'd leave that alone. LGND, we talked about that one. Legend Pharmaceuticals, LGND. Yeah, we talked about that one. Ligon, Legend, WBAI. Uh, WBAI is pulling back once again. Long entry point. Well, this one, a good entry point would be right around here. Did we talk about this one last week? So now it's not really a pullback. It's got a it's got a really clear. So now it have to really clear this prior high in here and pull back. Okay. So yeah, last week would have been the entry on that. Didn't we talk about it? AU for a trade. AU is going to be a gold stock. Uh, what's the symbol for gold? Anyone? AU, right? 
Uh, looks like it's bottoming out shorter term. It's going to have some uh, possible overhead supply to get through. But here's the deal. Most golds are going to be a little questionable anyway uh, because they're going to have overhead supply. I think this one could be worthwhile, uh, but you're going to have to wait a little while. Let's see if it bow ties up and could get past some of this uh, recent trading in here. But, yeah, definitely put that on your radar for a possible bottom. I mean, keep an eye on all the goals for a possible bottom. A and D for a fill. I say a fill. We have a couple of fills in here today. Uh, as long as we don't have any bad fills. Uh -huh. uh, yeah, that looks good. That's a goal stock. Absolutely. Oh, wow. Look at that. Oof. Oh, that I like. Oh, it's coming off of like 10-year uh, lows in here. Might have to give you a high five. I'm going to stop short of that. But, yeah, look at that. Longer term. Big old fat bottom. Okay. Uh, yeah, it looks pretty good. Um, shoot, yeah. Can't really fault it too much. Um, kind of bow tie -y. Uh Does have some bad memories here and there. Like I said, we're already long um, NG, so we've got something working here. Uh, but, yeah, that looks pretty darn good. That's, uh, that's going on my radar for sure. AFOP on a weekly chart. On a weekly, well, we're not trading weeklies. Uh, I hear you; it's pulled back, but on a daily chart, uh, today notwithstanding, it looks like it could be a trouble. Um, here's the deal: if you take a look at the semis overall, they're just busting out the new highs, or at least they were until today. Uh, so I think there's you could do better. DSX, that's going to be a shipper, right? Yeah. Um, you know, these shipping stocks can be really choppy longer term. That's one of my problems with it. I mean, up and down, up and down, up and down, up and down. Uh, I haven't done much mechanical testing in years, but I think when Stock Finder first came out, I did some mechanical testing, and I was testing a simple system. And I know some of your eyes are glazing over because you've heard it before, but um, this trend following system worked pretty good in all markets except shipping, okay, and some other markets like education, which is obviously a choppy market. So for me to get long a shipper, I have to really like it. I guess shippers are somewhat commodity related. So, but yeah, this one's all over the place. Where is it now? Thirteen? Where was it uh, four months ago? Thirteen? Okay. Uh, remember, it broke out past the prior highs in here. Uh, and one thing you need to to do. I mean, obviously the whole. I didn't give away the whole thing. Um, I can't do this on the fly. Um, but go in and watch, go in and watch the webinar I did on the introduction stock selection. And we talked about where you broke it, break out past a prior peak and you come back in. The pattern looks something like this. Okay. You want to avoid that particular pattern. Okay. It kind of hints at a double top. SLV for Don. I'm going to like that because I think silver's bottoming out. But silver itself hasn't quite bottomed out yet. But you've got a double bottom coming off of multi-year lows. You're getting ready to get a bow tie in here. So silver looks pretty darn good, okay? But I wouldn't buy it just yet. But your silver stocks are looking even better. If you take a look at the silver stocks, you'll see that some of those guys are looking pretty good. If I can find them. Where'd it go? Here we go. Okay. Notice the silver stocks have already bow tied. So in this particular case, it's like the stocks have bottomed out. They're not looking fantastic, but they're certainly worth watching for a potential bottom. And anytime you get a bow tie off of multi-year lows like that, it's certainly worth paying attention to. Okay. SSRI, best silver, IMHO. I didn't see who recommended that. I deleted it too high. Yeah, it's okay. Yeah. It's got some wide and loose trading like they all do, so you can't you can't pick apart these commodity related stocks too too much. Although the shippers I just don't like that much. I think I've always been a bit of a gold bug. 
and a silver bug. I used to trade kids on the playground for silver coins. Fro, if you like a shipper. Fro? Yeah, that one's okay. Uh, big picture bottom in place. Yeah. Yeah, that's the kind of shipping stock you want to go after. Uh, even though it is a little wide and loose, trade's a little cleaner. It's not set up right now. But if it continued to rally, I mean, this is something you might even see on one of my lists. I like the fact that it fell from grace. It's what I call a Phoenix stock. It used to be, what, 35 bucks a share. Now it's 5 bucks a share. So if it rallies past some of this fluff in here and pulls back, do not be surprised if you would see this on one of my lists in my trading service. Don't be surprised if we pull up that portfolio and you see uh, FRO in there someday. Okay. AUQ. Boy, you guys are all excited about the gold stocks. AUQ. A lot of gold bugs in here. Um, yeah, let's take a look at a long-term chart on that. Well, ideally, I'd like to see it at much lower levels, but hey, it's at its lowest level since in about five years. So we might give it a pass based on that. Um, not too, too many bad memories. Yeah, it looks like it's turned a corner. you got a bow tie off of these multi-year lows. I want a pullback. Absolutely. Put that on your um, put that on your momentum list. First little pullback there. It might be worth a shot. Again, with the golds, I'm going to be a little bit more lenient. Why, why for Mr. Peter? Why, why? Uh, yep, maybe on a pullback. Sure, why not? Nice little breakout, okay, but he need, needs a little bit of a pullback. PEIX, can we talk about that one? PEIX, is that like a, an ethanol? PEIX, I hate freaking ethanol. Yeah, it looks good. I've got this stock at one of my momentum lists somewhere. I want a pullback, absolutely. Okay. Uh, and it looks like it's getting rid of all its bad memories. God, as much as I hate, I freaking hate ethanol. Anybody out there in the old cars? It's just, just ethanol sucks. <laughs> UA for James. And it's stupid too. It's like, oh, let's 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 cut down all corn. And it's going to cost us more money to cut down the corn. We're going to burn more diesel cutting down the corn and grind it up instead of feeding the poor people of the world. Okay, and even the rich people of the world have to pay more for corn, so they have less money to spend on other stuff um, because they ground up all our corn to make fuel. Stupid. Stupid. <laughs> uh, this could be a short really soon, and it's going to be a beautiful one too. Here's the deal. Read the Go Go Nomo strategy, and I know I've got some issues uh, on the website. Oh, speaking of the website, um, I now have, and I'm, I'm, work, I'm working to transition over to to an Amazon server for the big files, and that's going to take a while. But I now have almost 10 years of service archives loaded again. I know they were up before, so some of you are probably thinking, big deal, Dave. You've always had that. Well, for those of you who are newer to me, who don't know me that well, um, I put out every trade I've ever, uh, I hate to use the word recommended because it's for educational purpose only, but every trade I've ever mentioned, how's that, is now available on my website. Um, so if you need the link, it's actually on a different website, but uh, if you need the link, let me know, and I'll get that posted to my website first chance that I get. Um, this could be a, and the reason I brought up website is some of the educational articles are messed up because I've, Upgraded my website and then I changed service. So the combination of those two things have really rigged havoc on all my files, and that's why I moved the service people. I moved the service. I had the foresight to move everybody off of my website, all my clients off before I did all this stuff. Um, anyway, I digress. Yeah, this could be a great stock soon, uh, and this is going to be a go go no mo. Write this one down, okay, as a possible short. It's uh, they make clothes, so it's a kind of a fad stock. They're kind of single single dimensional. Everybody and their brother has an Under Armour shirt, okay? I have a couple of them. Um, I love them, don't get me wrong, but it's just a shirt. There's nothing to get too excited about, um, okay? It's a workout shirt. I love old classics. I have a 63 Pontiac, Pontiac Bonneville. She's a beauty. Ethanol sucks for her. Yeah, I'm working on a 75 Pontiac right now, and um, it's just been it's been a 60-year process on this one car. And ethanol uh, has wreaked some havoc on it. Uh, it's horrible. When it's just, I hate it. I hate it. AMRS. AMRS. Um, 
if you long, stay long. It's got a, it's got a little too crazy in here. I mean, it's going from 250 to six, it's 200 and something percent over a short period of time. So stay long, but uh, kind of dangerous to go in. 69 Roadrunner. I got a neighbor with a Roadrunner. Cool. That's a cool car. I'm not a big um, I'm not a big Mopar guy, but uh, I have to admit the 69 Roadrunners. That's a that's a nice car. FMI for when? FMI. Um. Yeah, it's kind of getting its act together. Uh, usually, I don't like an IPO that just kind of goes straight down, but it is getting its act together. Maybe on a little bit more rally. Maybe on a pullback. Um, it wouldn't hurt to put that on your radar, but I don't see it setting up anytime soon. Okay. RGR, I think RGR has ran its course. RGR as runner has ran. Nope. Maybe I'm getting confused with SWHC. Yeah, on a pullback. Uh, this one looks pretty good. On a pullback, though, and I really like to see it clear this prior base quite a bit. It's also pretty mature in its trend. So um, that's my only problem there. It's, it's, it's kind of a long, long term trend, and it's very mature in that. It might be priced for. Uh, perfection, Christ the buff, yeah. DSW, DSW. Uh, yeah, this looks kind of interesting in here. As a possible short, it's kind of no, yeah, it's it's okay. Um, it's kind of wide and loose, but it looks like a major top. I can't argue with it too much. Uh, it looks like it's already cracked, though, so I'd like to find something like, take a look at that UA again. That UA hasn't cracked yet, and when it does, it's going gonna, it's gonna to have a quick ride down to about 50 bucks a share, okay? Missed soda. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's a stock. There's a go-go, no-mo type of stock. You know, they make, they sell CO2, right, or, or expensive CO2 to go in and make a soda. Um, but you really didn't have any great setups along the way. I'd leave it alone now. It's just it's already retraced 100% of its last little breakout. L B M H M H L B M H. Ah, that's pretty cool. Um, maybe on a pullback. Uh, this should be in some of my momentum list. If not, I don't know why I missed it. Uh, but it is accelerating higher, just blasting higher in here. Uh, it's been a pretty good run, though, so you got to be careful. But maybe on a pullback. Let's revisit it on a pullback. NVAX looking to go long, not in it. NVAX. Good. You know, most people most people have already bought the stock before they ask about it, so good for you. Uh, maybe on a pullback. I mean, it's broken out to new highs in here. This was one. This was the one that set up, remember, was on the Landry list, the one, the list that we showed early on. But it doesn't mean that it can't keep on keeping on, okay? But it has had a pretty good run. It's up about 300%. Maybe on a pullback. It'd be a little dangerous, though, but maybe on a pullback. Okay, PVA, did we talk about that one? PVA, PVA. Uh, no, it's just kind of getting past its prior highs in here. The other thing, the energies aren't really doing that well right now. So let's take a look at like the energies. You can see eh, energies looking a little questionable in here. Looking a little suspect. Energies, retail, and um, restaurants not looking so hot. So you might want to avoid those things. Jerry says run its course from my English teacher. Okay. So from now on, you can hear me say run its course. Maybe it has run its course. Okay. IG, thank you, Jerry. Jerry's a client. I'm not sure what relevance that is, other than my clients are smart. I have the best clients in the world. Uh, it's a little bit thin. It's only uh, 200,000 shares on average, and it's only three bucks. Okay, so that's pretty thin stock. So be careful. Uh, maybe on a pullback. It's going to have to pull back a little bit in here, but not too much. Ideally, I'd like to see a little bit bigger breakout than that, but maybe on a pullback. Okay, AMBA for Peter. I like that one, Peter. I have been liking it. Uh, yeah. Oops, I just slipped up. Look away from your charts. 
Yeah, I think we get the trigger right now. Yeah, this one's on the service. I think we'll get a trigger right now on that one. Sorry, I thought it was uh, my apologies. Yeah, that's a live trade right there. Absolutely. AMRS. Well, it's kind of stalling out and it's rally out of its pullback, so I think I would leave it alone. And it's already gone up 300% before it did all that. So, ARIA. I think we triggered on that one. I can't get to my screen, that screen that I need to get to. Uh, who, who asked for, Who asked about that? Hey, all right. What was it? Who asked about that one? Don, if that's you, you're going to get a no. There you go. You get a Nicholas Fine on that one. Come on, Don. You could do better. What's your cardigram? That's what your cardigram looks like. Yeah, no, you got this big, huge gap down. Anytime a stock has a huge gap down like that, it's got problems. So even if it begins a rally, people are going to try to bail out. You want to avoid that one at all costs. CYTK. CYTK. Don takes the heat off the rest of you guys, so uh, <laughs> we got to make sure we, we make sure we don't aggravate him too much because we want to keep him coming back. Yeah, this one looks okay. Uh, it's a nice bow tie coming off of uh, multi-year lows. It does have some kind of issues here that Gap had just talked about, but it did close it. It's a little crazy longer term. I prefer if this was coming off of, let's see, this is just like this is just like one year low. If this was like ten year lows, then maybe I can't fault it too much though because I he I hear you. It, it based, it formed a bow tie, pulled back a little bit, triggered. I'll give you an okay on that one. TSLA for Don Tesla <laughs> TSLA. <laughs> <laughs> You're trying to get Don in trouble, huh? Um, no, it's all over the place. I mean, it's at 170 or whatever. It was at 170 a long time ago. It's just all over the place. I'm um, surprised it's coming back, though. I am in Tesla Motors. Is the one I was, no. Don't get me started on those electric cars. I got to tell you, though, that Fisker looks pretty darn good, though. I've never seen one of these guys close up. It's always uh, from a distance. Uh, this thing looks like it's had a pretty good run. Maybe it has run its course. How's that? Maybe it's run its course. Uh, on a pullback, we could reevaluate it. But um, in biotech, maybe there's something in here um, that might be at a little bit lower levels that might be worth going after. DSW as a short. Well, we're not going to be shorting too much in here. Uh, no, we talked about that one already. Okay. All right, let's finish it up with uh, IG is a long. And I know there's a few guys I didn't get to. My apologies. Maybe we should have talked a little bit less like cars. Oh, yeah, we talked about that. Maybe a little bit more of a pullback. See back. Who? 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 No. <laughs> no, it's going straight sideways. No. Absolutely not. F L N F F T N T. I'm gonna have to wrap it up too. Um, no, it's this it's electric cardiogram. I don't know if you were going. I don't know if you guys are messing with me now, but yeah, that's electric cardiogram. So you don't want to. You don't want that. Uh, okay, thank you, Phil. I'm sorry. Yeah, sometimes these got these stocks slip out and. Um, but, uh, yeah, on this FTNT, there's a no, but, yeah, Phil, appreciate that. Uh, almost there, right? Yeah, almost to a trigger on that one. Okay, uh, I'm going to go ahead and wrap things up because uh, after about an hour and a half, it gets hard to manage the recording. Uh, I appreciate you guys being here. Thanks for taking time on your busy schedule to be here. Uh, any unanswered questions, shoot me an email, dave at davelandry.com. I will answer you directly. In worst case, if I get a little backed up, it will be fodder for next week's show. Everybody have a fantastic weekend. If we don't talk again, I'll see you guys again next week. You're welcome.